If you know a bond's yield to maturity, what information does it actually convey? Most books and <laughs> much discussion between market professionals and what you hear on the financial news networks typically talks about yield to maturity as a rate of return. Unfortunately, while yield to maturity might be used as a proxy for future returns, one needs to be extremely careful when using yield to maturity in that fashion. What yield to maturity actually is, is an expression of value. Or stating that same thing in another fashion, what yield to maturity precisely quantifies is the value or cost of the future cash flows on a bond. Hi, I'm Doug Carroll for InsidersGuideToFinance.com with another one of the many videos on yield to maturity. Since it is such an important topic and one so widely misunderstood, this will be the first in a number of videos devoted specifically to interpreting yield to maturity as an expression of the value or cost of future cash flows. I've done a number of videos already on the computation and the assumptions baked into yield to maturity. And in those videos, I made passing reference to how yield to maturity is an expression of value. But that's a very complicated subject and one which will take at least three or four videos to try to do full justice to. Naturally, when dealing with a complicated subject, it's best to start with the simplest case possible. So in this video, we'll discuss yield to maturity as an expression of the value or cost of future cash flows on the simplest sort of bond to imagine, a single cash flow bond a zero coupon bond or treasury strip. So let's begin the discussion by pricing a zero coupon bond or treasury strip given its yield to maturity. You see to my left the formula for pricing a single cash flow payable in the future, which is another way of describing a zero coupon bond or treasury strip. And that formula says the price is equal to the present value of the single cash flow, the par value at maturity, where that par value is divided by 1 plus i raised to the n power. So i is the yield to maturity expressed as a periodic rate, and n is the amount of time until the receipt of that cash flow, in other words, the time until maturity, expressed in number of coupon periods until that cash flow is payable to the bondholder. So let's price a zero coupon bond or treasury strip that has a $100,000 par value, matures in exactly 10 years, and is trading at a 2.6% yield to maturity. You see to my left a description of the bond that we're going to price. Below that, you see the formula introduced previously. And below that, you see the formula with the values for the bond whose description we have plugged in in the appropriate locations. Of course, several bits of information have to be altered to fit into the formula, because while the yield to maturity is 2.6%, since treasury strips, which we'll use in this example, assume semi-annual compounding or discounting, we have to convert that annual rate into its periodic equivalent and 2.6% annual would give us a 1.3% or 0.013 in decimal term periodic rate. And naturally in 10 years there are 20 semi-annual periods. So you see that information plugged into the formula near the bottom of the right hand side of the screen. And by performing the operations in the appropriate sequence we would find that 10 year $100,000 par value treasury strip trading at a 2.6% yield to maturity, trading at a price of $77,234.46. Now, while we have obtained the price, remember the purpose of this video is to discuss not price, but yield to maturity as an expression of value or the cost of future cash flows. So this is just an intermediate step. Now, how do we interpret that 2.6%? In many contexts, it would be discussed as a rate of return. 
But would 2.6%, the yield to maturity at which this Treasury strip was trading, actually represent our annual rate of return to maturity if we're held that long? Now, of course, the answer is going to be no, but let's work up to that. In many cases, when people first become aware of the fact of yield to maturity and rate of return not being really the same thing, the complication that usually intrudes is the one that would be encountered with the most common type of security encountered in the fixed income markets, and that is periodic pay coupon bonds. And one of the big causes of divergence between yield to maturity at purchase and realized rate of return over the time to maturity would be the fact that the future reinvestment rates on all the cash flows received prior to maturity cannot possibly be known. But that's a complication that arises with coupon bonds, and here we have a zero coupon bond. So many mistakenly believe that, well, if there's no coupon and consequently no uncertainty about rate of return on cash flows received prior to maturity, then at least for zero coupon bonds, the rate of return to maturity, if a bond were held that long, must be the yield to maturity at which a zero coupon bond or treasury strip was trading at the time it was purchased. Well, let's calculate the rate of return on that 10-year strip trading at a 2.6% yield to maturity. Now on the right-hand side of the screen, you see the rate of return calculation. The top line shows the generic formula, and then just below that, the computation of the full return, although below that, the formula gets disaggregated to help get some insight into the process. So the way one calculates a rate of return over any holding period is by taking the ending value, that would be the value of your bond or portfolio at the end of the measurement period. Most commonly in the market, that would be quarterly or annually, although in this case, it's maturity. Below that, you have the beginning value. Well, that would be in a asset management perspective, the value of the portfolio at the beginning of the period. In our case, it's the price we'd pay to buy the bond today. And that ending value divided by beginning value is raised to the one over n power, where n is the number of years to maturity, or the length of the holding period or measurement period, but in our case, number of years to maturity. And then subtracting one from that, which backs out the value of the initial investment, we're left with our annualized rate of return over the holding period. In this case, our annualized rate of return to maturity. Now, before focusing on that number, let, let's look at the, the formula disaggregated a bit. So ending value divided by beginning value would give you one plus your total return over the measurement period. Now, for our bond, the $100,000 par value will get at maturity divided by the $77,234.46 price. That gives us, well, 1.2947. You can see the number over there. In other words, our total return to maturity, if we held that long, would be a little bit shy of 29.5%. But most commonly, returns are annualized as a way of putting them on sort of a common footing to allow us to compare more easily rates of return over a variety of investments. Well, if we take our ending value divided by beginning value, which gives us one plus total return, raise that to the 1 over n power, where again n is the number of years uh, in the holding period, in this case our 10 years to maturity, that would give us 1 plus our annual return. So if we back out 1, which again reflects the value of the initial investment, whether at the bottom line or just below the top line formula, you see that we have a rate of return of a little bit below 2.62%. When rounded to full, the nearest full basis point, 2.62. Well, you'll note that's not the yield to maturity, which was 2.60%. Why the difference, since there are no coupons and therefore no uncertainty about reinvestment income, why the difference between the yield to maturity at the purchase of the strip and the realized rate of return over time to maturity? Well, of course, you can scroll back through the video to see, but what number is different in our price calculation versus our rate of return calculation? Well, naturally, it has to do with number of periods. Price and yield conventions are based on compounding periods, 
whereas rates of return are normally done on an annualized basis. So that's why we were using 20 periods in our pricing example and yet only 10 periods in our rate of return example. Now, one might recognize that 2.62 as the effective yield or the, the, the effective annual rate. And some people would say, oh, it's just the difference between compounding frequency and rate of return and we can dispense with that or it's easily adjusted for. So I can think of 2.60% when adjusted for compounding frequency as rate of return. Well, you could do that for a zero coupon bond, but remember most bonds are not zero coupon bonds. And I'm going through the initial explanation of yield as an expression of value or cost of future cash flows in this simple context. In later videos, we'll apply it to uh, valuing coupon bonds and looking at the, the spread between the yields on different coupon bonds and how yield or that yield spread gives us an insight into relative cost and how the market's pricing the relative risk of different securities, but we need to build up to that. So let's focus now not on that 2.62 as an adjusted yield to maturity, but how that 2.60% is best thought of as an expression of the cost of the future cash flows or the value of the future cash flows. So let's start our serious investigation of yield as an expression of value or cost of future cash flows by going back to the original pricing formula we started the video off with. Price being equal to the par value, the only cash flow on this sort of security, divided by 1 plus i, the yield to maturity expressed as a periodic rate raised to the n power. Now, as soon as you identify a specific zero coupon bond or treasury strip, a number of values in the formula are known, the par value and the n. Well, given the construction of the formula, once we know the, the cash flow at maturity and the length of time until that cash flow is received, there's only two unknowns that remain, the price and the discount rate, which once annualized becomes the yield. Now obviously one equation with two unknowns doesn't have a, a determined solution. There's a, an, in, an infinite number of possible solutions. But what happens as soon as we know one of those two remaining unknowns, again given we've identified a strip and therefore know the final cash flow and the timing of that cash flow? Well, as soon as we know one, the remaining variable is automatically determinant. In our pricing example, we assumed we knew the yield, that allowed us to calculate the price. But alternatively, if we knew the price, that would mean that we must absolutely know what the yield is that's consistent with that price. Now again, in coupon bonds, it's, it's harder to follow because there's numerous cash flows. But given the assumption used in determining yield to maturity, that is, it is the single discount rate when used to find the present value of all the contractual cash flows on the bond, generates a present value of the cash flows equal to price, the same interpretation I'm describing here in this very simple context of a single cash flow investment is ultimately the same interpretation you'd want to place on yield to maturity in any context, no, at, no matter the structure of future cash flows, whether they're fixed or whether they're a, it's an amortizing security so the, the cash flows vary over time. The single discount rate calculated in that fashion is really nothing more than a re-expression of value. It's the price re-expressed as a single interest rate or discount rate. So to work up to that interpretation, let's algebraically manipulate the pricing formula to separate out the variable of interest we want to focus on, that's the yield to maturity. So now on the screen you'll see in parallel columns the algebra necessary for determining yield to maturity and then the values plugged in for the bond we're working with. So on the left-hand side, you see the, the adjustment to the formula. So starting out with the formula, price equals the par value divided by 1 plus i to the n. Since I want to separate out the discount rate, 
That means we need to multiply both sides of the equation by 1 plus i to the n and divide both sides of the equation by price. Well now, in the next line, we see 1 plus i to the n equals the par value divided by the price. But if I'm trying to calculate the yield, that means I need to isolate the i. So that means I need to take the nth root of both sides of the equation, which would leave us with 1 plus i is equal to par value divided by price raised to the 1 over n power. And then by subtracting 1 from both sides of the equation, I now have i isolated. Now you'll note that will calculate for us the periodic rate which then has to be annualized. So since the treasury strip in this example assumes semi-annual compounding or discounting, that means multiplying the periodic rate by two. So on the right-hand side, you'll now see numbers plugged into the formula so derived to calculate yield. And we find a periodic rate of 1.2999%, 0.012999 in its decimal form. And by doubling that, we get the yield to maturity of 2.6%, well, 2.5999999. But of course, that's effectively 2.6%. So some of you might be saying, well, so what? <laughs> we just proved uh, that the formula was the right one for calculating the price, because given the price, we now squared back to the initial yield. But I just wanted to create a broader context within which we will now pluck one variation of the formula sort of midstream from the algebraic manipulations. The third line from that page showed 1 plus i to the n was equal to the par value divided by the price. Now some of you might recognize the left hand side of the equation as the formula for calculating the future value uh, of a dollar invested today. But let's focus on the right-hand side of the formula for the moment, the par value divided by the price. What would happen if we performed that division? Well, of course, if you take the par value and divide by the price, that will find the amount of money you would have by maturity per dollar invested today. So if we perform that division, we come up with 1.2947, the same number we calculated earlier when we calculated the to 1 plus the total return to maturity. Which means that for each dollar invested today, I'll have about a buck 29 and a little bit shy of a half, 10 years in the future, for every one dollar I invest today. Now, we're not quite there yet. Let's go back now and, and bring our 1 plus i back into the discussion. Now, of course, we, we saw the, the calculations derived on the previous page, but that meant that if we now solve for i, we get an i of approximately 1.29999%. And we saw earlier the connection between that discount rate and the market price of $77,234.46. So how can I interpret that 1.29999% as an expression of value? There's obviously direct linkage to the price because we use that discount rate to calculate the price. Well, to state it very precisely, it represents a geometric ratio, or probably more commonly referred to as the common ratio. In other words, that 1.299% approximately 1.3%, is the periodic rate of growth, not annual, but periodic rate of growth, for each dollar invested today to grow to the principal amount or par value it would be received at maturity. So that sounded a little bit technical. I was relying upon the proper mathematical terminology, geometric ratio and common ratio but maybe a less formal way to get at the same idea is that yield to maturity is a way of expressing the value of future cash flows relative to what you're investing today. That's honestly the only technically precise meaning of yield to maturity. And again, it gets a bit more complicated in the context of coupon bonds, which is why I'm starting it here in the most simple case possible of a single cash flow investment, zero coupon bond or treasury strip.
but a way of expressing it somewhat succinctly, oversimplified a bit, but it captures the idea, is yield to maturity is a way of expressing the relative cost of future cash flows. And so in a way of summarizing things, when I'm comparing two bonds to one another, zero coupon bonds or coupon bonds for that matter, if I'm comparing two bonds to one another and one of those is trading at a higher yield to maturity, that implies I'm paying less today per dollar of future cash flow. Conversely, if when I'm comparing two bonds to one another, one of those is at a lower discount rate or yield, that means on that bond I'm paying more today per dollar of future cash flow. And for two bonds trading at the same yield to maturity, it doesn't necessarily mean they have the same expected return. It means they have the same cost today per dollar of future cash flow. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can go to our YouTube channel or Facebook page to see other videos on a range of investment related topics. Or you can go to the website, insidersguidetofinance.com. At our website, in addition to the free video shorts, there are a series of modestly priced in-depth training videos with running times of approximately one hour each that go into a number of subjects in greater detail. The website and Facebook page also contain information about open enrollment programs I will be presenting over the next few months and my recently released book, The Insider's Guide to Fixed Income Securities and Markets.